You're listening to the Sketchnote Army Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Rohde, the author of the Sketchnote Handbook and the Sketchnote Workbook. And this is the podcast where I chat with sketchnoters and visual thinkers and try to understand what makes them tick. This episode of the Sketchnote Army Podcast is brought to you by Neuland, the innovative maker of visual thinking tools. Every Neuland product is designed with passion to be durable and sustainable. Check out their newly redesigned Neuland Find One line of water-based refillable markers. The rich black permanent outliner in bullet and brush options. The crisp, fine lines and rich colors of the sketch line. The flowing, variable brushes and colors of the art line. Save 15% with code AMB290425 at Neuland.com until December 31st, 2020. In this episode, I talk with Patty Dobrowalski about her path into visualization and her passion for drawing your future. We talk about the power of visualization and how we as sketchnoters and visual thinkers are perfect facilitators for this work in the world. Everyone, welcome. And I'm excited to have Patty on the line with me. Patty, welcome to the show. Hi, Mike. Oh my gosh, this is, this is like the thrill of a lifetime to be here. Well, I'm excited to have you here because you've got some really interesting, valuable stuff to talk about to share with the community and listeners. Patty, tell us who you are and what you do. Yeah, I'm a live illustrator, keynote speaker, and author. And I my focus has been to create an ambassador program to show people all around the world how simple it is to draw a picture of your future and step into it. Wow, that's that that's really what I want to get into because I as we sort of came across each other, I watched your TED Talk, which I loved, uh, and we'll, of course, have in the show notes. But uh, I thought it would be fun for you to kind of dive into that. But tell us about the kind of work you do. You talk about being a, a live illustrator and some of those other things. Tell us what that looks like on a day-to-day basis for you. Okay. Well, right now, I spend a lot of time in online format drawing pictures of meetings or conferences. I also give talks and teach classes in how to draw and also how to improve your online presence because Mm. I was once an actor. And so that's how I got into it to begin with. I was an actor. I held a picture in my mind of myself on Broadway. It came to be and I was like, oh my God, how did that happen? Mm. So I became obsessed with how do you hold an inner vision of what it is you want, visualization, et cetera. But then one day I was sitting at a business meeting and that's a whole story of how I got into business because I was really an actor, right? And so I think all good business people are actors, in fact. Mm. So there I am in this meeting and a guy comes in, his name's Gordon Rudeau and he's just amazing illustrator. He gets up, puts paper on the wall and draws a picture of what we're talking about. And this was I don't know, 25 years ago. And I'm like, that guy is making a lot of money drawing a picture at the front. And I think I can do that. <laughs> I was I was poster girl in high school. So I had good handwriting. I didn't know mm-hmm. how to draw. But I thought it cannot be that hard. I am not going to be up here in this like little, I had to wear like a skirt and a suit. And I was like, this is not me. Ah! Mm. <laughs> So, you know, I just started to draw way back then. And ever since then, I have um, just done a lot of research on the neuroscience behind how visuals work with your brain. And then on a day-to-day basis, I show people, I draw a picture of the future for them, or I show them how Mm -hmm. to draw their own picture of the future. And, uh, And I experiment with foundations and big business and and small business and individuals all the time, just drawing. I draw as much as I can and I love it. Hmm. Well, that takes me back, I guess, probably 10, 15 years ago. I'd heard the concept from mainly athletes that talk about visualization, visualizing like race car drivers who visualize, they close their eyes and they visualize the track and how they're going to take the perfect line around a corner or skiers that are imagining themselves going down the hill and where the where the technical parts are and how they're going to attack it and football play, like you know you the list goes on uh, yeah. so obviously visualization has been a big deal in the sports industry or the sports spaces and i think it's starting to be more common in other spaces 
Yeah. Talk a, talk a little bit about how, why does that, why do you think that works? What's the neuro, what are the neurological reasons? Why does that have, have researchers found that that's actually so effective? Thanks for asking. Cause I think this is the thing that people need to know um, the most, because you'd draw a lot more if you knew <laughs> that it would get you further faster. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And you know that from sketch noting how that, that really helps you retain information. So we know that from all the educational studies, but um, about a year and a half ago, I was contacted by the Economic Protection Bureau. What is it called? The, 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 um, the, is that the EPA? Maybe? Yeah, like that. And they um, were trying to, at, they, at first I thought somebody had stolen my identity. I was like, oh no. <laughs> and then they, they wanted to know, could they use my draw your future process to help people b save better for the future? Because they weren't mm -hmm. doing it. People weren't saving money. And they were like, we got to do something. So Consumer Protection Bureau, that's oh, it. Okay, there we go. And so um, they said, can we do this? I said, who's running the study? And they said, Professor Hal Hirschfield out of UCLA. And I'm like, I got to go meet that guy. And I happened to be in LA taking a workshop myself. And um, I went to UCLA and I met him. And we talked quite a bit about how the visual and the idea of a future you actually helps you make better decisions in the here and now. And I, I talked about the studies that we had done um, when I did the at Hoffman LaRoche, where they used a picture to help their teams understand better the vision of the future for the company and how it improved their ROI, right? And so we talked about those concepts. And one of the things that he shared with me is that if you have a direct link to a future you, a future self, a strong relationship with that future self, and you, um, you'll you make better decisions in the here and now, but if you actually act on that future, you improve your chances of success by 42%. Wow. 42%. Wow. So that's when I say to people, hey, you know, if you draw a picture and you take action, you will improve your chances of success by 42%. Why? Because, uh, and Jim Quick talks about this in his book, um, Limitless. He talks about the RAS, which is the reticular activating system in your brain. Mm. So, you know, you get 2 billion bits of information all the time, you know, that are coming in like that. And you have to, your, your RAS, it's the part of you that calls out the, the pieces that are important. Mm. So it sifts out the stuff that is not important. Like the RAS is like, get rid of that, that, that. But the ones that you highlight yourself in, in any way you can, through feeling, uh, through an emotional experience, through drawing a picture of it, which you don't normally do, um, by highlighting it, then you put it in your brain in such a way that it, it wants to make that happen. Hmm. It looks for that. It tries to so, um, fill the gap with that picture, right, between hmm. you and that future you. Wow. And I think from the TED Talk, you talked about you have a one in nine chance of making a change in your life. Yeah. Um, yeah. So right? one out of 10 people will actually make change happen. That's what Even it was. if yeah. you're facing a life threatening illness. So we're that talking was, about that. That was really that, surprising. Yeah. If you're a smoker and you know that smoking is killing you, you have cancer, you, only one in nine will do it. Wow. So, and it's really. It's really tough. And I mean, think about we're in the middle of a pandemic right now. So that's right. You know, can you come up with a more pervasive, yes. life threatening situation, right? Like exactly. And think about the people that are not wearing masks. There you mm -hmm. go. That's, right. that's really the, the nine, nine out of the one and then versus the one, you know, we should be wearing a mask right now. Don't you think Mike for our podcast, you never know, it might come through the airwaves. <laughs> exactly. Um, so that that brings me back to so you taught the RAS is is that that's a system in our brains that does the pattern recognition the combination of retina and brain that cycle right. that's looking for patterns that you know we've used forever to sort of identify danger I guess to begin that's with right. but then has been modified to yeah. identify other yeah. things right like something's out of place like you know we're big fans of Adrian Monk uh, right. the TV show you know he yeah. he's set, he is such a good. I mean, he's of course fictional, but his his ability to spot things that are out of place is what yeah. makes him unique. He's not a psychic or anything like that. He just no. notices, right? Right. And that that I think is really the tip 
is that you want to give your brain a, a reason to notice. And so if you can think of your hippocampus, you know, as a stream of images, just like in the, the old slide decks that we would have when you would, mm -hmm. you know, in the old days, you would have a projector and it would drop down a slide and project right, on the screen. This the carousel, is before yeah. any of you are, ha are born, but <laughs> this would go, that's what your, your hippocampus is in your brain. That part, the long-term memory, it just holds those images like in a C and your job really is to highlight it. And so how mm -hmm. do you highlight it um, when you sketch note, right? And you're taking notes, you're highlighting for your brain what's important. And you're also helping yourself create links between these concepts and um, concepts that you know and already have in that database of you. Mm. You just sort of put your, you're aligning them in a certain particular order, or maybe in some cases they're not in you, like it's a, it's an ideal state. You're sort of trying to align yourself toward exactly. that ideal state, right? A future you that you want to connect to and build a strong connection to. And that, mm. that's the, you know, this is the magical part of it that I love. And, I, you know, the scientists, they can, they can come up with as many theories as they want. But what's mm -hmm. true is when you draw a picture of a future that you want to live in and you put it somewhere you can see it every day and you take small actions, not big actions, you can take small actions, it happens. And I have thousands of testimonials from people around the world who have watched that draw your future and they have just commented on how it transformed them and you know that's wow. not rocket science that process yeah. but it really is helpful and i especially now during the pandemic you know you're filled with all these wild images and fear mm -hmm. uh, rules the day so you have to calm yourself down the best way to calm yourself down is attach yourself to a future that you want because mm -hmm. it automatically presses the end of story button inside your brain and that mm -hmm. shoots that dopamine into your system and so why not complete the story with a future that you want versus a future that you fear mm because your brain's always going to try to complete the story, right? Mike? Right. It always wants an ending. So give it yeah. the right one. Exactly. You're sort of defining the ending. That. So you said something in your description before that I think I was going to, my next question was, so you talk about drawing your future, but I think the next part of it is in a place that you can see it. So it sounds to me like a component of this is first you draw the future. The second part is, you're constantly looking at it and reminding yourself of what the future is because you can't always count on your memory or remembering every detail, especially if it's a detailed future, right? So talk a little bit about the practice of how you remember, how you keep it active in your memory. And then we can get to small actions as the last part. Yeah. Let me do a roll back for a second to the okay. current state because in the process, you actually look at and reflect on, draw in words and pictures on the left side of a piece of paper where you are right now. Okay. Now, why do you do that? Because what it does is it distances you from it and you're like, oh, that's what's going on. And then you like get up, run around, drink water, and then you sit down and imagine it's a year from today and you draw a picture of the best case scenario. So you have to get your critic out of the way and you try not to tell yourself, um, you know, no stress because the brain doesn't understand the difference between no and yes, right? Mm -hmm. So you put up there all the things that you would want. And I start with the qualities and characteristics and then I build the picture out to have the specifics. Because some things you don't know how what it's going to turn mm -hmm. out to be. You can't control every so little thing. Even if you draw the picture, you right. know, there are some things that are out of your control. So you have to put up there what you want to feel like at the end of the change, the mm -hmm. end of the year. And then you add some specifics in there. And then once you put that up there... Your brain doesn't know the difference between past, present, and future. It's like, hey, Mike, that's your new future. I mean, that's your new now. You're here. This is you. And you're putting on that, you know, new book and, you know, a billion people in the sketch, uh, sketch note army, right? You know, all those things uh, in that picture. And then all you need to do is to activate it. So you bring it to life by looking at it and clicking on it and daydreaming. Because daydreaming is really how you reprogram your brain. Mm -hmm. 
And if you daydream like, oh, and then you get information from what I call your creative genius, right? That's the part that dips into your subconscious that for every movie or book you've ever read or conversation somebody had, your brain thinks that's all you, right? So it just pulls out something from that. And it feeds it to you. This is what you're going to do today, or here's something else to think about. And then if you pay attention to that and act on it, then things just happen. Boom. They happen right away. Hmm. Is there a, is there a specific amount of time you should daydream? I mean, is it maybe less of like, oh, it has to be, you know, two hours, but it's like, what's the minimum can it be like a few seconds? Does it need to yeah. be a few minutes? Is there an ideal? I think it can be a few seconds. Yeah, okay. you just look at something. Like if you think about something that you want, you really, really, really want, and you build it out in your imagination, p- capture it in a picture, and then build it out even further. Every day you're going to get some insight and understanding mm-hmm. because what's happening? Your RAS system is activating. It's showing you in your Google feed of your, you know, on the, on your computer, all of those things that are in your brain and out in the real world. Right. And Jim quick gives this example in his book about, uh, his daughter wanted a certain kind of puppy, a pug. And so she showed him a picture of it. And then what happened was everywhere he went, he saw that dang Mm. pug. And he knew he was going to have to get that, right? Because she knew and she activated his RES. And and that's what we're doing. And and I think that that can happen with anything that you want, Mm. anything. I can, I relate to that. When you talked about that experience about the pug, that reminds me, and this is more after the fact. So like when you buy something, like say I buy a new iPhone, like now suddenly I see them everywhere. I buy a Volvo. Like suddenly I see my car everywhere. Like you're suddenly attuned to that thing that you're aware of. So it's like, in some ways, what you're talking about is almost like you're meditating on the future state for some period of time, right? Visually and mentally meditating and allowing your brain to bring up the subconscious raw materials to make it happen. Like, oh, I hadn't thought about that thing over there could lead to this solution. Maybe it would be one step closer, right? And I think that's part of it. You know, when you want something to happen, you have to put yourself in that that alpha state, right? We're in the beta state all the time. We're going like Mm -hmm. that. But you have to calm yourself down. And in that calm state, you connect to who you are and why you're here. And those things, I think, then you begin to align yourself, your true self, to the future that you want. Because... uh, the gap between you and that future has to do with your level of awareness that that is your God-given right to have. Does that Mm. make sense? Mm -hmm. If you grew up in an environment where that didn't seem possible or whatever, and you've been inculcated with imagery of what is not possible for you, then that's what you believe. It's the record you Mm -hmm. put on in your brain. So you have to unwind it. And the only way to unwind it really is to go in and unwind there because in there the unwinding begins hmm. and that that's why it's so important to before you go to sleep first thing when you wake up in the morning to remind yourself i'm in this world but i'm not of it right honestly you're not you're made of essence and light and sound and love and you know these things that we never really talk about because mm-hmm. we're so tactile and we try to make a living and you know what I'm saying? We pull it all down. But the truth is that, and I think a lot of people during COVID, now you realize what's truly important to you. And service is a big piece of it. And so I think that's that's really why I've been showing people more than, more than ever now how to draw, draw their future because we need this now. We need to be hopeful in a world that's filled with a lot of chaos right now and fear. Yeah, this, I really love this. Um, so it's it addresses, especially for this audience, already people who are, have an interest, self-selected interest in drawing, who maybe do it already, maybe even professionally, who hadn't thought about, you know, using it as a tool. And it sort of reminds me too, I just rewatched uh, the Karate Kid series with my wife this week. And I'd forgotten how good of, well, at least the first two are pretty good stories. Like the story yeah. structure is super clear because I've been studying story. And what this reminds me of is that you're basically telling yourself a future story. You're using the 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 human, I guess, language of story, 
like all sketch noters use that same language. We just happen to illustrate that story. Like some people use words, some people use images on a screen, some people use music, right? There's different ways to tell the story, but we're all all sort of designed and primed to operate on story. So why couldn't we simply tell ourselves a new story instead of accepting the one that we're in or that we're given, right? That's basically your argument with That's this it approach. That's it in a nutshell. That's it. Mm. Yeah. It reminds me a little bit, I've talked about this before. I think about uh, science fiction. So science fiction writers now, some you know, now lots of these old shows are becoming videos, but back in the 50s and 60s, science fiction writers would write about technology that didn't exist. Like you think about Star Trek and communicators, you know, in the sixties, you might think oh, we're never going to have a pocket sized communicator <laughs> that could talk at far. Like we have it right. You know, the space program, could they have ever imagined that there would be a computer many times more powerful than the computer they sent guys to the moon with in your pocket and everybody's pocket, right? You think about the imagination that they had for the future and it's like it's almost like once you call it into uh, into being in some way, there's almost a drive inside some people to make it exist. Right? I think that's a little bit of what you're tapping into too. Is that when you describe a future, and if you could do, it could go the opposite, right? You could describe a bad future for yourself, and it could <laughs> it could come to exist too, right? And you can you'll activate that RAS system. So you have to be that. careful about what you wish for, right? Yeah, or what you think, you know, you forget mm-hmm. that your brain is not is not you. It's a part of you and right. you have to train your brain to focus on the right things. And that yeah. takes work and practice and it takes images. Images help so much. And even drawing a picture and I'm sure you've talked about this many times, but when you draw a house that somatic experience actually brings it to life for you and it and it it fills you with this integrated sense of who you are and that uh, all your DNA is all lined up. Like if you draw the infinity symbol in the air, right? That does this similar thing, but drawing a picture will too, because that's, um, that's what we learned from Betty Edwards, right? Hmm. I really like the idea too of maybe a living drawing, right? So maybe I'm kind of perceiving that maybe you build it in a basic way to begin with. And, like as you do this meditation on the concept each day, you probably are now seeing new ways to approach it that you could, if you did it in such a way that you could annotate it and continue continue to annotate it over time, that it could actually get more refined and more detailed yeah. uh, as you go. Is there practice around that? Yeah, I, I would say th- I learned this because I wanted to be a bike racer. Uh, when I turned 50, I decided I was going to be a bike racer. I, I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, I and so I wanted to win, of course. I'm a little competitive, so I wanted to win. So, you know, my first time out in a time trial, I thought, oh, my God, I'm past three people. You know, it would be fantastic. And I was last. And it was mortifying to me. And I was like, how can I be last? I just trained so hard. And then I really studied what it was. But the way I studied it was I drew a picture of it. I took one because that was one aspect of my bigger picture of my life that I had drawn was that I would be successful bike racer, right? So I took that and I did a mini map just on that one thing. Hmm. And I let myself test and try things in that um, so that it would give me insight. So my creative genius would drop insight in, you know, which is research and, you know, um, and then rehearse, right? (laughs) As an actor, I would think rehearse. And then, you know, move from that place to go into action. And so I think that allowing it to be a living thing, you're living, right? So people will Mm -hmm. say to me, oh, my God, like some people, I'll draw a map for them or they'll draw their own map. And then they'll come back a month later. That all that stuff happened already. And I'm like, that's that's how it works. You know, time to draw a new map. (laughs) Time to draw a new map. That's exactly what I say, because you're growing and changing. And and the more you're aligned with the picture of what it is that you want, the faster it happens. Your hmm. our secret task, of course, is to figure out how do we get more in alignment with that which we want. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we have to learn things and do things, stretch ourselves, I think. It could be really interesting. I, this, I'm just starting to imagine practical applications, which is just my tendency to do, is if you built, like you could maybe dedicate... Um, a journal to this practice. Yeah. Maybe it's a big journal, right? And the first page you sort of, maybe you're gathering 
the idea and you do your first map on the first page or something. And then yes. each day you look at it and you've got a section of the page or a page and you write something that's come to you as you ponder it. Right. And then maybe there's a point 10 pages in where after looking at the map and writing, you now all have all this new information. Now maybe you reimagine the map with that new information integrated and maybe it's got actions, right? So you just keep on, it's like you draw it, you review and you write or sketch You could even do drawings and stuff and then redraw it again. Like there's this sort of a living aspect that this, this journal, and then by the end of it, you could sort of go back and observe where those pivot points were and then replicate that for the next time you do it or to share with others, right? You could draw some inspiration from that. When people often ask me, you know, how, how often do you draw a map for yourself? I go, anytime I feel stuck, are you kidding? Hmm. I I'll draw it if I want more information, if I want to. So what you're talking about though, is really what we're going to collaborate on is that, um, draw your future journal. You can come up Hmm. with all the details of it and then I'll, we'll, we'll work together on it and roll it out because it's really a sketch note thing. You're really talking about how can you augment it? How can you change it, make it grow and make it a living document? for yourself and and then know that it's not like a fixed thing so that's what Mm -hmm. i tell people you know (laughs) this is one moment in time we've captured it's going to accelerate what's happening it's an activator so when people come to me and they say yeah i was thinking about starting my own business and so i thought maybe i'd have you draw a picture i go you're ready for that to happen right away right and they go uh, yeah, <laughs> because I think so. Because it, <laughs> it will. So, you know, like people will write and they'll say, God, I wrote, quit my job, and then I had to go do it. I did it. <laughs> you know, mm. As that bold step in between. And that that's a key piece of it is that between the current and the future are three bold steps. And I put three mm. bold steps um, just because I think three is easy to remember. It's a nice and one yeah. is always bold. Like one is like that quit your job or, you know, quit smoking or whatever it is, if your map is about your health or whatever. The second one seems to be a tactical one. In all mm-hmm. the maps I've drawn, everybody always, the second one is bold, but it's still tactical. It's stuff you got to do like a PR plan or, you know, whatever, if you're trying to pivot yourself to be online. Um, and the third one is a mindset shift. And then I'll have people break it down into action, a small action plan, like something you're going to do right away. So you can press the Mm. success button and then get Mm -hmm. the dopamine hit. So you're programming yourself to want to act on the map, right? And But they'll say, well, how can you turn a mindset shift into action? So I'm like, you can. Like if it's fear, let's say that you're inundated by fear, like we are. What we know to be true is one action we could take is not turn on our media until 11 Mm a.m. You know, Mm -hmm. don't start your day with fear. Start your day with something else, your focus or what you're doing or your service. And, um, you know, things like that. So you can turn anything into an action plan. And then when Mm -hmm. you have an action plan, then you can measure it. And when you measure it, then you can feel successful. You get that gold star at the end of the, (laughs) you achieve in that little tiny action. Hmm. I think if I remember right from the TED Talk, you talked about the one in nine number you talked about the 44, I think it was 44, 42%. Yes. And I think the, that the other thing you were saying is that by doing these small action steps, I think you talked a little bit about the future state needs to be so attractive that it's makes you willing to put up with a, maybe a little bit of pain to get to it or something yeah. along those lines. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, you need to scare yourself out of where you are. You know, the reason Mm. that we stay in this normal state and we put up with what's happening in the world is because we're comfortable. It feels comfortable to some of us. And so we're Mm -hmm. like, don't rock the boat. Well, that's how your brain is. It's like your amygdala is like, don't rock the boat. You like this job. Don't leave that job. You know, you like this world, right? And so, and what's true is you have to like scare yourself a little bit and you have to say, yeah, but if if I'm still doing the same thing in 10 years, how am I going to feel? Or if I'm still making the same amount of money, if I'm still letting, you know, uh, Elizabeth Gilbert write every book that I should be writing, then I'm crazy, right? Does that make sense? So you Mm -hmm. have to accelerate it for yourself, play it out, like do a future pull way out there of who you want to be and make sure that this, where you are right now is aligned with that. Otherwise, Mm -hmm. 
you know, you're going to be at the end of your life wondering, God, did I do anything? And, you know, I learned from this, I was illustrating for a talk yesterday and it was, um, this woman has a TED talk on grace notes and Mm. it was really amazing. But what she talked about is how that everyone, the biggest thing that people want is to know that they've contributed and that they're of value. And so Mm -hmm. you want to make sure that you draw your future, step into it so that you have brought the value to the world and that you know that you've done that. Hmm. Really interesting stuff. So what what's what are you excited about going forward use, uh, with all this work that you're doing? I, I'm most excited about my collaboration with the DeBruce Foundation in Kansas City because they're expanding economic pathways for people in their community, and I love that. And they have something called the Agilities Profiler, which you can take for free online at agilities.com. Hmm. Dot org, And that tells okay. you what your top three agilities are. But I'm partnering with them because if you know your strengths, your agilities, and you draw your future, you have a huge advantage in the marketplace. Mm-hmm. So we're showing, I've trained a bunch of people, cadre of draw your future ambassadors there. And they're going into the schools, their high schools, and um, early college years to help people. And I'm really excited about that. I love mm-hmm. them. And I love working with them. And I like doing that. Well, that sounds really cool. Thank you for sharing so much about this. I think this is a really good practice for sketchnoters to consider and to do and to try. So thank you for sharing this information. Yeah, my pleasure. We're going to shift a little bit to tools because people on the who listen to the podcast tend to be fans of learning about other tools. And I think, you know, in general, you know, I'm I'm a believer in that the tools don't necessarily make make you better necessarily, but they may enable you to do things Uh, more easily or more effectively. That's sort of the way I look at it. So I'm always on the hunt for a new tool that maybe could improve things that could replace an old tool that's maybe not as effective or maybe my life is changing and, you know, I need something different to solve the problem that I'm facing. So talk a little bit about your favorite analog tools. And then if you use digital tools, what are some favorite digital tools that you use? Yeah, I am. I'm a really analog uh, and mm-hmm. I'll talk about digital, but it'll be more on the um, on the uh, holding a podcast, a uh, vlog online, or holding mm-hmm. an mm-hmm. event online because that's what I'm. That's the space I I love and I'm interested in. And when they have tools there, I really love them. But analog, okay. you know, I am a big fan of Newland pens. I just mm. oh, yeah. I'm crazy about them, and. Um, I, I used all, all gamut of pens. You can imagine from Sharpies to Copic markers to Prismacolor. And I run out of black pens so much because I, <laughs> I draw in black, as you yeah. know, and yeah, then I use a lot of it. Color. And everything I do, I'm not a, I'm not a sparse minimalist drawer. When I'm up there, I fill that page with images and color with Tombow. You know, I color all the things and people in, and then I pastel the entire background, whether Mm. it's landscape or it's just one color to pull it out. And so I use anything I can get my hands on. And I use cheap pastels because Mm. I go through so many of them. Okay. Um, so those those are my analog things. And I would say this piece about uh, digital. Okay, so I there's a new platform out for when you want to do an event with people, mm-hmm. a live event. It's called Remo, and it mm. is the coolest event uh, management. Like there's, um, you go there to, if you're holding an event there, there's a main stage, right? So mm-hmm. I get on the main stage and then all of my people, my creative geniuses, they, they get to a table and right away you have your own zoom thing. So you and I'd be at that mm. table talking just like we would be right here. Mm. Um, and the, the next piece that I love is that it has an elevator. So you can go up the elevator to another floor. So you could have mm all these different um, layers of floors that you could expand into. And I was in a conference where they use this technology and the main speakers were like, I was illustrating in the MC for it. And so they said, now we're going to do breakouts and you're just going to go to the floor that's on your, you know, that you've been given the number for, and then you're going to end up at a table and there's going to be a contact there and you want to exchange information. Well, I was like, I want to just want to go up the elevator, you know, so I press the <laughs> elevator button. I go to the fifth floor because I like that, you know, fifth floor. And so I'm up there. 
a woman drops in there and she's like, oh my God, I've always wanted to talk to you. And she's like head of some big company. And she's like, yeah, I think that we could use your services right away. And I was like, oh, that was wow. stupid. So, you know, that kind of a thing, I think you want to look for tips and tricks like that. And they mm-hmm. all have a whiteboarding mm-hmm. capacity so you can draw on them. I'm, I'm not a fan of the whiteboards that they often give you to draw. Yeah. I'd rather draw on my iPad. I use an iPad to draw with and um, Mm -hmm. I do everything. You know, I use Photoshop and InDesign and all of those kind of tools to draw things. And then I'll use their their built-in program. I can't remember what it's called, but- Is that the Notes app application that you use? Yeah, yeah. And so I I just use what they have there because I just Mm. think it's- you know, if you could draw on your own pad with a with a screen on top of it to make it like feel like it's a piece of paper, anything that feels like it, that's what I want. Hmm. Yeah, I think lots of these tools, like I really like Miro. I like Mural as well. Both of those are really good tools for collaborative work. And so many of them do have whiteboard, you know, components. The big problem with it is most people are coming to it in a browser. And when they try to draw, it's really hard and scratchy and not smooth. And, you know, I can come there on the iPad in many cases and use the tool that they've created and it works pretty well, but I'm like the only one or the only couple who That's can right. use that. So, I mean, it's a, uh, it's a little yeah. bit of a, uh, equalizing thing. We don't have some kind of a stylus is not a standard component for most PC users. So it's, it's kind of an interesting space. It's almost better, you know, it's better like turning a camera, which I've been doing when I do teaching is I just have my iPhone going through yeah. the Mac and I use that as my camera as, and you can buy document cameras as well, which I haven't, haven't done yet, but there's other ways to just simply yeah. do that or rebroadcast your iPad. But I yeah. mean, then it's the collaboration part is still difficult, I think. It is. And I, I think in my office right now, I have three drawing walls. I have two huge drawing walls where I can do a big drawing. And then I also have a whiteboard because sometimes I'll want to whiteboard things for mm-hmm. people. If I'm doing a concept, I want to expand it. But I go through more paper and and unfortunately burn through more trees than many people. And mm. so I'm always like donating money you know, to offset the carbon footprint. Of recycling that. your old drawings that you're not keeping or something, oh, I definitely. suppose. You know, I give them to people because I draw at least three big drawings a day. And normally mm. they just go in the recycling bin. So I give them to all the neighbor kids. Hey, do you want something for your wall? I drew this great mm. picture. You know, send them out. And we should probably just, you know, send them to people or deliver them. <laughs> just, just randomly you get something yeah. at your door. Wouldn't that be fun during If COVID? you go to the conference, you get a random, you get a giant poster. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good giveaway is, idea. Is there a certain kind of paper that you like to use that you prefer to use when you do that work? Uh, you know, yeah, I, I use anything that's 16 pound to 20 pound, okay. four foot five, a million, right? Uh, white, uh, white paper. And, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes I'll draw and I'll do some chalk on black paper, but only during the holiday mm-hmm. season do I do something like that oh, okay normally I'm just doing that with um with that Newland marker my new favorite mm-hmm. marker those Newland regular permanent markers and yeah. you know, I never used them before I used Copic markers and they just run out right and now I can refill these I like that I can refill them which is quite messy if you don't know how to do it so heads up yeah, I think there's uh, they definitely provide some uh, <laughs> some uh, videos on how to do that properly I haven't <laughs> I haven't done, I've only I've tried that once them. and it was messy I for me. I never watched yeah. them. I just figure out. Same problem I've had too. So <laughs> I've, so far they haven't run out for me to have to fill them in. Um, so um, that's going to be an interesting uh, challenge when I come to that, but I know there's tons of resources. Yeah. Um, sure. So let's shift to tips from Patty. So regular listeners will know that I look for uh, three tips from people who come on the show just to talk a little bit about what they can recommend, I sort of frame it as someone who's listening to the show is into sketch noting or visualization of some kind. Maybe they feel like they've hit a plateau and they just want a little bit of uh, encouragement or inspiration or even ideas for how to improve their process. What would you yeah. say? Uh, the first thing I would say is learn to observe. Hmm. That observation is really the best teacher. That's how I taught myself to draw. I never took an art class. I just saw I saw the world and an artist would say to me, you know, just look at it and then try to recreate it. Take the hardest Mm -hmm. thing you could do, um, the corner of the room, the dimension of something and recreate every little thing that you see just with a pencil and a piece of paper. That's the first thing, observe and then, then create it. And the second thing, 
for me is that you want to feed your creative genius. You really do. It loves learning new things. So mm. take a class, do something that's different. It doesn't have to be a drawing class, but just take a class on, I don't know, whatever cybersecurity or, you know, something <laughs> so that you feed your creative genius new information because that's what it's looking for. And the third thing is when you want to get ideas, immerse yourself in a messy room, in a messy space. You know, people mm. feel like, you know, um, they would say, you know, cleanliness is next to godliness or whatever. And what I would say is for, for an artist, um, messiness is a good thing. So fill your room or your space where you like to draw with things that are interesting to look at. Mm. And then if you don't have enough there, buy a visual dictionary and open it randomly to a page do a small meditation on the image and then draw it. Hmm. Those are really three really great tips. Thank you for, for sharing those. I'm a big fan of observation and, and uh, so that's a really great place to start. And thank you're you for fantastic, Mike. It, you're just so awesome. All the things you're doing and all the people you've had on your podcast, they're really great. So I encourage your listeners, if you have not listened to, his stuff, do that because it's really good. Really great. Well, thank you. We we definitely have uh, all those uh, past episodes available for you to listen to. So there's lots of real gems. We try to make them evergreen. So if you listen to them in the past, there's still going to be interesting discussion and suggestions there. Um, so thank you, Patty. Um, how can people get in touch with you? Where can they find you so they can learn more about your process and how to map your future and all these things that you're involved in? Yeah, they can find me at upyourcreativegenius.com, upyourcreativegenius, G-E-N-I-U-S.com. And okay. just know that every quarter I do a free five-day Draw Your Future Challenge. It's a five-day challenge. And in that, you can learn and do all the pieces mm. and components of Draw Your Future with me for free. And it's awesome because there are so many amazing people that come from all around the world to do it. Mm. So you get to meet them, be part of a Facebook group with them if you do that. And if not, you just are in immersed in the experience where you get like a directive every day and a video. That's one way. And then I have classes, of course, at creativegeniusu.com. And those classes range from Wizard at the Whiteboard to Draw Your Future certification mm -hmm. so you can be an ambassador. Or I've been doing, I have a lot of Flip Your Business, Ignite Your Online Business, and a free class coming up called Flip Your Fear and, you know, crush it in a virtual platform. So come come do that and just check that out, Creative Genius mm -hmm. You. Wow. And so are you, are you active on social media? Is there somewhere where someone can follow you? Instagram, Twitter? Of course, I'm on all I'm on all the formats. Um, Facebook, up your creative genius on on Twitter. I'm on with my name. So if you don't know how mm. to spell it, it's tricky. P Dobrovolsky, D O B R O W O L S K I. Go follow me there. And Instagram, of course, a pure creative genius. I'm there and I post a lot of personal things on Instagram too. So if you're wondering, like today, I posted that we were going to do this. I was very excited. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, and thank you for having me as your guest because it was just awesome to be here. And thanks for all your great questions. It's so fun to have you on and to explore this space. And it's something I know I've done in the past, maybe not so structurally. I know in the past um, I've written goals out, you know, where that's just writing, but adding the component of drawing really seems like it makes sense to me. And it's an opportunity for me to take up the challenge and do this, uh, do this with my own life right now. This is a great time to do that. Yeah. Perfect time. Well, thanks Patty for being on the show and for everyone who's listening That'll be a wrap for the Sketchnote Army podcast. Until the next episode, we'll see you then. Woo! The Sketchnote Army podcast was created by me, Mike Rohde, and brought to you by Rohde Design Studios. It's produced and edited by Alec Polianis of Amp Creative Studios. The theme music was created by John Schiedemeyer. To support the creation of this show, I invite you to buy one of my books, The Sketchnote Handbook or The Sketchnote Workbook. You can find the books on Amazon or... Go to peachpit.com and use the code RODI40 for 40% off. Please share this podcast with other visual thinking friends and be sure to leave a nice rating on iTunes or your favorite podcast listening app so others can find the show. 